free energy curves in them, right? you have these two regions of limited solubility uh, in the solid state, and that could be from two different free energy curves that cross over, or it could come from one free energy curve with a hump in. And at some point that just runs into the free energy curve of the liquid when you go to high enough temperature, and that's what creates the eutectic. And once the eutectic comes through that common tangent, you get these um, two phase regions. Um, as I mentioned, we're not really spending much time on figuring out how to read phase diagrams uh, in this class, but just um, there's sort of a very simple principle uh, to reading phase diagrams. If you, you know, if you want to know what happens when you cross any line, say, uh, any phase boundary, uh, you really just have to figure out what you had before you crossed the boundary and after you crossed the boundary, right? So, so let's say, for example, what happens at the eutectic temperature? Um, let me actually, let me put some numbers on here and we'll do freshman chemistry again. You know, let's say you have like 30% of B in some mixture and let's say this is 20% here and this is 60% this point and say this is 90%, uh, just put some numbers on it. Um, so if you're say, you know, let's say you've cooled to here, right? You are nine, the, you have liquid and alpha, you're in that two phase region. And remember, right, you can read of the composition, the composition of alpha is this, the composition of liquid is this, and the, the lever rule can tell you the fractions, right? For example, if you wanna know uh, just before, so, just for T, just above T eutectic, right? You could figure out from the lever rule, say how much liquid you have, the fraction of liquid would be, what is that? 30 minus 20, right? 30% 30 minus 20% divided by 60% minus 20%, right? So that's uh, 10 divided by 40, so that's 0.25, which means that the fraction of alpha would be 0.75, right? applying the reliever rule. Now, if you want to know what happens at the eutectic temperature, you can sort of redo that exercise just below the eutectic, right? What should you be there when below the eutectic, you're in a two-phase region uh, between alpha and beta. So when, when T is just below the eutectic, now you clearly have to have a lot more alpha because your composition is much closer to alpha. So let's calculate uh, what the fraction of beta is, the fraction of beta would be 30 minus 20 divided by 90 minus 20. So that's 10 divided by seven, so one over seven. So what you figure out from this and what you also see from the phase diagram that at the eutectic temperature, the liquid completely disappears, right? You have liquid just above the eutectic below the eutectic, the liquid is completely gone. So the, so the eutectic reaction is that liquid has to react to alpha plus beta, right? Because as you're cooling down, there's this phase here, this liquid to this composition, which if you bring it down any further, it has to decompose into uh, alpha plus beta. And so this is the eutectic reaction. It makes a single phase disappear upon cooling and brings into uh, other phases. And of course, upon heating, um, the opposite happens. I will come back to that later. Um, sometimes the solubility in the solid phases is very small. And you'll see a eutectic phase diagram like shown like this. So where um, the, the the single phases solids are essentially collapsed into the axis. Just don't get confused by that, right? This diagram is really the same as, as, as this diagram with extremely small solubility limits. And sometimes in published books, the reason they'll draw that is because they don't even know what the solubility limits is. They're so small, they haven't been measured them carefully. And so you'll see something that looks like this, which seems like it violates the phase rule, but it doesn't, right? There's really like an uh, a teeny weeny sort of single phase region here, which you kind of don't see, right? So in this sort of approximation of the phase diagram, the single phases are always pure A and uh, pure B. Um, I gave you a few examples of eutectics, and I wanna give you uh, a few more 
since they are so important technologically um, because the eutectic has of course this feature that you can create lower melting points than you can have in any of the pure elements or pure compounds, uh, whatever the end members are. Um, and we talked about things like ethylene glycol, we talked about solder. Um, the one of course that we have has come up a few times when we talk about um, um, melting point lowering is the one of water and salt. Uh, and the one of water and salt is actually a eutectic. Um, so eutectic, so of course the, let's say this is H2O. Temperature to show the melting point of pure H2O is zero Celsius. Uh, but when you add salt, so sort of this direction is salt. And remember, sort of the melting point of uh, salt up there is uh, like above, this is something like 900 Celsius. So it's, it's totally off the scale here. Um, but the system forms you, um, a eutectic phase and this sort of shoots way up there. So I can't like really complete it. The eutectic phase diagram, uh, the eutectic is about at 23 weight percent of salt uh, and is at, um, this temperature is minus 21 Celsius, which is something like minus uh, 60 Fahrenheit or so, I think. Uh, no, sorry, minus six Fahrenheit or six Fahrenheit, six Fahrenheit, yeah. Um, so, so you now see that there's this potency of salt to melt ice, but you also see that that has its limits, right? So there's an ideal uh, amount of salt and water and if you do more, then you're basically just, if you do more, then you're just ending up in this two phase region here. And first of all, you're kind of lowering, uh, bringing the melting point back up, uh, but you're actually just adding solid salt to the road, which isn't good either because salt is quite slippery. Um, but there's another important point, right? Below minus 21 Celsius, there is no liquid in this phase diagram. So the potency of salt is still limited that if it ever gets colder than minus 21 Celsius, which you get in Northern climates in this country, uh, there's no way you can melt ice with salt because all it shows here is this two phase region is really ice plus salt. And so, you know, if anybody's sort of from these cold climates, you know what they do. Uh, you can actually replace salt by an, another chloride. So if you do this, so this is with sodium chloride here, right? which is just normal cheap rock salt. If you do this with calcium chloride, the phase diagram looks almost exactly the same, uh, but the eutectic temperature is depressed and I had it somewhere here. I can still find it. Uh, okay, I've lost it. But with calcium chloride, the eutectic temperature with calcium chloride is much lower um, than with sodium chloride. And so if you live in Chicago, for example, they always have a handy stock of calcium chloride to throw on the road um, rather than sodium chloride. So the only problem with calcium chloride is um, that it's more expensive uh, as a salt. Um, let me give you a few other applications since some of these are from a general knowledge perspective. Uh, tremendously important. Uh, because this idea that you can lower the melting point of things turns to be tremendously important in materials processing. Um, and, and a key one uh, for which this is the case is uh, aluminum smelting or aluminum refining. So as, as you probably know, aluminum is, is created by electrochemical refining. So whereas um, um, most of the cheaper metals are refined car uh, carbothermal. So if the way steel is made in the end is by the way iron oxide is reduced by having carbon as a sacrificial agent. So carbon picks up the oxygen uh, from the iron oxide and creates reduced uh, iron. And this is why the steel industry is one of the most intensive uh, CO2 emitters, right? Because essentially what you do is you do, it's a little more complicated, but the basics of the reaction is that you essentially do something like this, going to iron plus a mix of CO and uh, CO and CO2. 
and you balance the equation, right? So uh, in some sense, your reduction energy comes from burning carbon. Uh, you can't do that with aluminum anymore. Why do you think that is? Is it a better uh, oxidizer than? Yeah, it's a, it's a more uh, electropositive element, right? So it's delta G of oxidation is lower than that of carbon. So if you wrote the equivalent out, right? Al2O3 plus carbon, trying to go to Al plus either CO or CO2, that depends on the temperature, what the end product is. So for this, the delta G is positive, pretty much at all times. Whereas here, the delta G is negative. And this is one of the main reasons that iron um, is cheaper than aluminum. Uh, because actually, in contrast to what you may think, uh, aluminum is the more abundant element in the crust. So this is not an issue of natural abundance. This is just an issue of how you can make it. So how do you make uh, aluminum? You have to make it electrochemically because if you remember our lectures on chemical equilibrium, so electrochemically you can, you can apply much larger driving forces than um, chemically. So what you have to be able to do is to make some kind of system where this becomes a set of ions, the aluminum oxide, so aluminum three plus and oxygen two minus, and you kind of pull out, you create some kind of membrane through which you pull out the aluminum and do it and electrochemically pump it up to aluminum metal. And that's done in, in um, I think a process that probably should have gotten the Nobel Prize because probably one of the most useful things ever invented in refining the Hall Herald process. And it's a, a brilliant piece of engineering, but as you'll see, it relies on eutectics. So the brilliance of it is that uh, you make a cell. It's, this is a large cell. We're not talking about a little battery. This is like many rooms large. And um, you melt aluminum oxide. And I'll tell you in a second how you do this. So the aluminum oxide becomes liquid. And that is actually the electrolyte because aluminum oxide is a terrible electron conductor. It's a membrane that lets the ions uh, conduct. Them. You stick in a carbon ele electrode, and then uh, you apply current to the bottom, and the bottom will be aluminum metal. So you apply a potential here, and this is actually the membrane. So at the interface, aluminum oxide gets reduced. It makes aluminum metal. The aluminum metal is liquid too. And because aluminum metal is denser, it just sinks to the bottom. So it's brilliant, right? This is like, you don't have to actually make your cell. The cell is just a container, but uh, the liquids are self-separating by density. Uh, aluminum is much denser than aluminum oxide. And then you have a little like faucet here. I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit. And here you tap out the liquid aluminum. And you can do this continuously. So you keep on like throwing in aluminum oxide, you run current and the aluminum comes out. Um, so the question is how can you do this? Because the melting point of aluminum oxide uh, is above 2000 degrees. What is it? It's 2072 degrees, which is ridiculously high, right? You know. What you should learn in material science, anything you have to do at temperatures like this doesn't just cost you energy. Uh, once you go above things like eight, 900 degrees or a thousand degrees, price of materials to contain your reaction start to go up exponentially. So here you're starting to talk about things like, you know, materials for jet engines, right? Which you cannot do in an, in an uh, electrochemical process. So what they do is they actually add uh, cryolite. Uh, sodium three aluminum fluoride. That's not balanced, six. This is cryolite related to kryptonite. Um, and cryolite makes uh, a eutectic with uh, aluminum oxide. And so the eutectic temperature in this system uh, in the Al2O3 sodium three aluminum F6 system, this is at about um, 960 Celsius. And this is pretty amazing, right? So, you know, you're going down from 2000 Celsius to below a thousand. 
and that now becomes manageable. You can sort of make containers and materials that can do this, uh, and you can actually melt the aluminum oxide by adding cryolite, and the cryolite is not consumed by the electrochemistry. So basically, it just stays there as a, as, as a flux, as something to keep the melting point lower. So basically, you can run this continuously, and you never have to replace the cryolite. You throw in aluminum oxide, aluminum comes out, and voila, you have aluminum. And the remarkable thing is that you run this industrial machinery at something like three volt. Like in principle, you could run it on two Duracell batteries, right? Of course, it's three volt and like thousands of kiloamps of current, right? It's like mega amps of current. So it's, it's the worst, if you're an electrical engineer, this is your worst nightmare, right? It's low voltage, high current, right? You know, we like to do everything the opposite way, right? We like to do high current, low voltage, right? Because it's much more uh, efficient. Okay. So this is what makes aluminum fairly cheap, right? So price of aluminum, price of aluminum, I think, I don't know what it is today, like, you know, one, maybe $2 per kilogram, something like that, right? So it's a lot more expensive than, than iron. Iron is more in the 10, 20 cents, I think. I haven't looked recently. But it's much reasonable, right? Which is why we can make things out of aluminum. So the, the real question that, that drives this field for the last 20 years is why not titanium? If you invent the equivalent of the Hal Herald process for titanium, first of all, you'll be a very rich person and you can donate to the department and we'll set up a chair in your name. Um, but you know, why is titanium expensive? So titanium is probably like five, six dollars a kilogram, which doesn't seem like a lot, but the fact that it's four or five times more and historically has been much higher as well, has been up to 10, 20 dollars uh, a kilogram. Uh, titanium is essentially just a better version of aluminum, right? It's lighter, it's stronger. So anything you make that has to be light weighted, which sort of, you know, cheap, if, I don't know if anybody's into bicycling now, right? You can buy a really cheap bike that's steel. You can buy the slightly more expensive one is usually an aluminum alloy. And then you can go to titanium alloys, right? Because the bike is even lighter. And so that's almost always how the sequence goes, right? Higher end products that need to have a high strength to weight ratio are titanium. Titanium is almost as abundant as aluminum. Uh, actually, aluminum is the most abundant metallic element after silicon, depending on whether you count silicon and, and the metallic element. But titanium is not far off. But in reality, the ore is actually more abundant. The reason is that most forms of aluminum oxide that we find in nature, we can't really use well. We have to use bauxite. Um, so titanium is found as TiO2, which is so cheap that it's a pigment, right? TiO2 is used to color paint and color cosmetics, color everything, right? It's kind of an additive because it's a good absorber. Um, so this is what needs to be done, right? You need to find an electrochemical process to do the same for titanium. Because now the way titanium is made is, sadly, you first turn the oxide into a chloride, just like silicon, and that's the only way you can purify it. So you have to go oxide, chloride, metal, um, and that's an expensive process. So. Think about it, right? So the, the problems are all very similar. You need to find additives that give you a low melting point. You need to find some electrodes that you can stick in there because, so have you thought about like this melt is a fluoride containing melt at a thousand degrees. Okay, that's like super aggressive, right? Um, traces of water make HF, right? When you have fluorides around. So this is extremely aggressive towards the metal. Many startups have tried to become a titanium uh, producer, but have failed. So here's your challenge. The world would be a better place if titanium was the same price as aluminum. Okay, but now for something lighthearted, um, but just as important, which I promised you last time, how you make um, clear ice cubes. Because my ice cubes in the fridge never look as good as in a bar. Not that I've seen any bar in the last year. Um, but so why are ice cubes cloudy?
Have you ever been to the fancy bars where you get like the one big cube? Like if you get a glass of scotch, right? And it's really fancy, they just put a giant uh, cube in there. Um, so the question is, how did they make it so clear? Because the problem with uh, uh, making ice cubes is that uh, I, uh, water almost always has some air dissolved in it just by exposure. And uh, water and air also form a eutectic. Uh, it's a very small eutectic, but so again, this is zero Celsius here, pure water. Um, but it actually makes eutectic. I actually think that this leans the other way. So it's a bit of an unusual eutectic, this kind of leans the other way. Okay, but so let's mark the phase regions because it may look a little complicated. Okay, so here's the liquid, right? Uh, here's the liquid plus ice. This is the ice phase, right? And then here you have like uh, probably a two phase region that would be liquid plus gas, right? And then here you would have ice plus air, so the gas, right? The two phase region should look something like that. So what happens when you solidify water with air in it? Where's my cough? Ah, found it. Okay. Let me tell you what the problem is in your freezer if you ever make ice cubes in your freezer. Let's say that you know you have a certain amount of air dissolved in the water and you start cooling down the water, right? So at some point, you know, you cool down and you hit this point. So at that point you start to make ice. And what's the composition of the ice? So the ice only takes up a tiny amount of air, right? Very small. So a little bit of the gas molecules are dissolved. So as you cool down further, the liquid retains more gas because you can make more and more solid. Uh, and that solid has very little gas dissolved. And the way that's done in a typical ice cube, so if you take one of these trays, right? And so you put water in here, right? You know, these tray things that you stick in your fridge, right? Um, so because the heat transport is from the outside, the ice cube starts to grow from the outside. So this here is ice, right? Because it's cooled from the outside and here in, at some point you still have liquid. So the liquid is contained in the ice cube. So if you keep on solidifying, at some point you hit the eutectic. So what happens when you hit the eutectic? So when you hit the eutectic, well, think about what happens when you go down here, you only have ice plus air. So when you hit the eutectic, this ice solidif the remaining liquid solidifies, but also has to make a gas phase. So it makes a bunch of bubbles in the ice. And so the eutectic solidification of water with air in it creates bubbles in your ice. And that reduces the clarity of your ice. There's actually a second reason, but if I say that, then this problem doesn't sound as good. But of course, because there's a volume expansion between the ice and the water, there's also some cracking going on in the ice. And so both the bubbles and the cracking uh, essentially cause light scattering, right? And that's why the ice is not clear. Um, but you, you know, you should actually do this. You should stick like one of these trays in your fridge. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see bubbles in the ice after it's frozen, which is bad, right? You cannot run any cocktail bar where you can charge $20 for a cocktail with ice like that. So what do you do? I ask this every year. And every year, the class gives me the same answer first. And I think you're gonna be better, but maybe because you read the notes and the notes are not better. What do you do? You're an engineer, you're hired at fancy schmancy bar on top of some fancy building. How do you make the ice cubes acceptable to your customers? Chikrovsky. 
Gross. You're going to show, grow um, the eyes by Chokrowski. Actually, um, that's not a bad idea, even though it sounds kind of weird, um, because um, the solution, I had never thought of this. This is an original answer. It's kind of slightly related to Chokrowski. Um, so um, I'll tell you what most of the time the class is. Well, the, most of the time the class is, well, you should degas the water, right? Which is a perfectly fine solution, except it's just ridiculously slow and expensive. Right? You could pump vacuum on the water before you freeze it and try to get as much gas out as you can. It's just that while that's chemically perfectly fine solution, it's just ridiculously uh, slow. So the way it's actually done is by, and you know, it's by directional growth, which is kind of a bit like Chakralski, right? Uh, I, I guess you were going to pull the ice cube out of the water, but you know, that's also kind of expensive to do for a lot of ice cubes. Although I guess you could make something with like pins that sort of pulls a lot of them out, but it's actually done quite a bit simpler. So what they do is you make uh, a tray that's open on one side and you use running water. So you have these kind of uh, holders and you run the water across. So H2O is circulated across uh, and the cooling is only done from one direction. So you, you, you cool from the bottom so that the ice starts to grow in the bottom of the tray. I can never say the word tray without thinking of Eddie Izzard. Does anybody know the comedian Eddie Izzard? No, like one of the best comedians ever. You should watch him. Look up Google Eddie Izzard Lego skid uh, after this class and you, any bad things will disappear from your mind for a second. For, for more than a second. Anyway, so you do directional solidification. And now what happens is that basically the ice just grows from the bottom of the tray. And uh, you know, when you hit the eutectic, the, uh, the air just gets expelled. And of course they recirculate the water, right? You're not gonna waste all this water running over it, but that's how you make much clearer uh, ice cubes. I'm sure you could come up with uh, other ways. By the way, that's why ice in streams is so much more clear, right? If you see ice in streams and you know that sticks to branches because it has directional growth and its growth surface is actually uh, exposed uh, to the atmosphere. Okay. Don't tell me now you don't le learn important things in uh, thermodynamics. Oh, by the way, this is actually relevant for other things. Um, so you, you have the same problem when you, um, when you solidify metals. If you ever get a chance to go to a big uh, like metal processing plant where they make you know aluminum ingots or steel ingots, these are enormously large, and uh, liquid metal almost always has gas dissolved in it, and that's because of uh, exposure, but it's also usually just because of reactions that create gas, sort of impurity reactions, and and the phase ions are almost always eutectic. So what happens when you melt a giant uh, when you solidify a giant ingot? So an ingot is a large piece of uh, solidified metal, right? And just to put in perspective, uh, these things can be like two meters across, five meters uh, in the other direction. So they're enormous, right? Um, there will be a lot of uh, eutectic debris in it and, and, and a lot of gas bubbles enclosed in the metal. And nobody wants metal like that, right? So what do you do there? Uh, you can't exactly do directional solidification. It's kind of way too hard for a metal. Uh, what do you do there? I mean, you're an engineer, right? Somebody could be asking you this. Well, actually, what do they do? Does anybody know? You can't anneal it, right? Don't tell me to anneal it, right? You know, if you know something about order of magnitude of diffusion constants, you're trying to homogenize something that's like meters across, right? You can calculate what the root, the, 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 the square root of dt is, right? Which is roughly the diffusion length for any reasonable diffusivity in a solid, which is like 10 to the minus 10 centimeters squared per second. So you can't anneal it, right? You know, anything in the industry, never say annealing, right? Because it's expensive. It takes long, right? I mean, can you imagine annealing, homogenizing a block of like meters across? So they mechanically need it, right? So they run it through rolling mills, right? That's how you actually homogenize uh, materials that just solidified. You, you do rolling mills, you hot roll it, right? So it goes in here, comes out smaller, and you do that many times. It's like kneading bread, right? 
The way you homogenize dough after you've mixed it is by kneading it. Uh, and that's how you homogenize it, is by mechanical mixing uh, uh, of the metal in the solid state. Uh, much more effective. You can do this in like two minutes, roll it back and forth three times. These rollers will, so they will literally take a piece of metal that starts out being like 10 meters long and they adjust the rollers and they run it back and forth. And by the time it's done, it's much flatter. And it's like 100 meters long. So that's kind of the way um, this is processed. Okay, back to thermodynamics. Well, this was thermodynamics, just another flavor of it. So we're going to go back to um, free energy curves and discuss um, a slightly different version uh, of, of um, combining liquids and solids. Um, so the way the eutectic appears is that if you take the low temperature common tangent between two solids, uh, as you raise the temperature, remember then the liquid will come down relative to the solids because the liquid has a higher entropy, means its free energy comes down more. It comes down in the common tangent, right? So it breaks the common tangent into two. Uh, there's another solution where the liquid comes down and first appears outside of that low temperature common tangent. And that leads to uh, what's called the paratectic construction. So let me sort of try to develop that here, slightly more involved. So I'm gonna draw a bunch of temperatures uh, get all your color pencils out. Um, let's say we do alpha, we do beta. And then maybe sort of when you're at low temperature, the liquid is just sitting up here. Oh, well, I didn't do that right, right? Because that would make it come through and it comes, like it doesn't appear anywhere. Sorry, so this is T, I'll just call it low. Okay, so the, Again, in the eutectic, right, this blue, the free energy curve of the liquid, will come down and would break through this tangent. In a paratectic construction, uh, as we'll develop now, this liquid comes down on one side. It doesn't come down uh, in the tangent. So uh, let me draw how that looks like. It's a little harder to draw. So that means you now have two common tangents. Right, so and your your sort of second temperature of interest. Maybe I should call this T1. I'm going to put them on a phase again. So we're going up in temperature, say this is T2. So what's going to happen next, right? You should try to sort of start anticipating this. So obviously, as you raise the temperature, the liquid comes down more and more because it's the higher entropy phase. So at some point, these two tangents will line up. And I'll draw that in a second. And after that, as the liquid keeps on coming down more, there will just be a tangent between liquid and alpha and beta will have disappeared. So let's kind of draw that. So let's go to what's called the paratectic temperature. That will be where the three tangents line up. And the way that's easy to draw is if you first draw the tangent. Darn, missed it.
And you're now in the equivalent of the um, eutectic, right? So you now have three phases on one tangent. So here you have alpha, here you have liquid, but here you have sort of some combination of alpha plus beta plus liquid. I was hoping to get everything on one board, but I didn't plan well, so. Ah, let me continue here. So this is, I'm gonna call this TP because we'll call it the paratectic temperature later. I can make this a little shorter. And squeeze something under here. Okay, so at, uh, I'll call it, I don't know, T4. The liquid's going to come down over there, so I would have alpha, beta will be high up, and I will have liquid. And I will just have a common tangent between alpha and liquid. Okay? So, so I haven't done anything that's like rocket science here, right? I mean, you should, you should be able to do this because you just need to know what the relative entropy is of these phases because that's what tells you how these curves move. What gets a little harder is now how do you make a phase diagram out of this, right? So you now have to take something that sort of respects this order, the sequence of phases as you raise the temperature. And in a paratectic, that's a little trickier. Uh, in a true paratectic, but you'll see in a second I will do um, simpler versions of that. So how does a paratectic phase diagram look like? It used to be a fun, um, not fun for you, but a fun qualifying exam question to ask students to draw a paratectic because it like totally twists you to in, in lines. It seems like no way to connect all the lines in the right way. I said, not fun for you. Um, I don't think we do that anymore. No guarantees though. Um, okay, so let's try to put a phase diagram together that has all these lines going right. Uh, so somewhere we're going to need a three-phase equilibrium, right? So maybe I'll draw the horizontal for that already. So that's going to be TP. Above TP, we just have two phases, alpha and liquid, right? So the high part of this um, is going to be a two-phase region that ends up at... Um, so I'll make this alpha, I'll make this liquid. So this is alpha plus liquid, okay? And now what do I do below? So below, if I'm below TP, I need to have three single phase regions. So the liquid has to continue, it has to stay. And I also need beta to appear. Okay, so the liquid has to continue. So there has to be sort of, some domain here of liquid, right? So I'm gonna sort of draw the extension here, but beta has to appear. And remember beta just kind of breaks through this tangent here as I go lower in temperature. So beta has to appear here somewhere, right, as a single phase. And so this is kind of an important part. Now I just have to find a way to connect all the lines, right? And this is where usually things go wrong on the exam. People have a sense of um, aesthetics I've noticed and they like to make all lines come together in a point. So I see a lot of phase diagrams where like, you know, regions look like that and it's very aesthetic, but it's kind of wrong. Um, so this is the one time not to worry too much about aesthetics. Well, okay, the liquid has to go down to what would be the melting point of pure B, right? That's easy. The, you can't have the liquid, um, the liquid has to reach the axis somewhere at the melting point of pure B. And then uh, 
somewhere here is going to be, so this is going to be a two-phase region between beta and liquid, right? And the two-phase region has to disappear at the pure axis because I don't have two-phase regions when I'm pure. So this line, this is how you can do this, right? This line has to end up here. Okay. And then what do you do with the other beta line? Well, that one has to end up there if that's the pure B solid with no solubility, right? And so this is beta. To see how we sort of logically work through this, rather than sort of guessing where all the lines go, and then this goes down here, right? Okay, so three single phase regions, alpha, beta, and liquid. So peritectic comes from the Greek to melt low and uh, to maybe try to impress you again, not that I'm sure it's working, but um, I was gonna write it out in Greek. You know, Greek is actually very easy because you know the Greek alphabet like, and you just do a phonetic translation of the, the English letters to the, the Greek ones and you're almost always right, right? So peritectic, the first one is, is P, that's the pi, right? So it starts with pi. The, the E is epsilon, right? So it goes, the R is rho. I forgot what, uh, and I is just I, right? The, the, the T is tau, right? Peritec, I forgot what C is. Oh no, kappa again, right? Peritec tie. Okay, I'm cheating. No, that's the alpha, sorry. Something like that. So that's peritecti. Pi, epsilon, rho, i, tau, epsilon, kappa, tau, alpha, i. Okay, so that's peritectic in Greek. And that means to melt on the edge. And there's a lot of discussion in the field in the academic field why it means to melt on the edge and as and you know the joke what they say about academics right you know why they say why uh, the joke about why they argue so much in the academic world because it doesn't matter um, but so I'm not sure it matters but uh, I'll, I'll let you try to figure out also why it means to melt on the edge it actually probably has something to do um, okay what it is not which you can remember, it's not because the liquid is on the edge here, okay? Because the people who coined the term peritectic didn't know phase diagrams yet. But it has something to do with the way you solidify in this material. So let me like do a solidification. It's a little tricky. So let's say you go right through here. That's where you hit all the complexity. So you go through all these different phase domains, okay. So what happens? First you have liquid. So that maybe I'll draw sort of a sequence of things. First you have liquid, right? Then you enter in the two phase domain, you get liquid with a little bit of alpha. So you have a little bit of alpha solid, right? That's when you're entering the two phase domain. Okay, then you hit the eutectic. So what happens when you hit the, the sorry, peritectic? What happens when you hit the peritectic? Remember the rule, right? You figure out what you need to have before and what you had after. So before we had liquid plus alpha, after, so somewhere here in between is the peritectic, but now we've cooled below, we should have beta plus liquid, right? And you have liquid in between. So what happened when you crossed the peritectic? So here we have liquid plus beta, and here we have liquid plus alpha. Well, the less informed mind may say alpha transforms to beta, but that can't be, right? Because alpha has this composition and beta has that composition. So you can't transform two things into each other if they have a different composition. So what actually happens is that alpha reacts with the liquid 
to make beta, right? Because you can make something in, if you have two phases here, alpha and liquid, you can make anything with compositions in between. So the peritectic reaction, is that liquid reacts with beta, sorry, liquid reacts with alpha to form beta. And then after that, what happens? Okay, now you're in the beta plus liquid region. At some point, you're solid beta, right? You're in this here, phase domain. And then you go and you have alpha and beta, right? That's the sort of equilibrium cooling. So let me give you a hint of why it is possibly called a peritectic. It's because of the problem with the peritectic reaction. So let's analyze again what happens near the peritectic. So at the high temperature, right, I have liquid plus some crystals of alpha. So this is above Tp. Below Tp, Tp, I have beta. And I'm not quite doing this in the right ratio, right, with the lever rule. There should be a lot more beta. So this is below the peritectic temperature. And so here what happens is that the liquid plus alpha reacts to beta. Right? That's the peritectic reaction. The question is, how does that happen kinetically? So what happens is, let me sort of zoom out here, zoom out on a particle of alpha. So the liquid starts to react with this thing. Uh, liquid is always blue, right? Um, so liquid starts to react with this and starts to transform from the outside. So it makes beta. So this here is beta, right? And the problem is at that point, the reaction really slows down because at this point, the liquid just sees beta, right? It just sees the interface with beta. And the only way it can consume further alpha is by diffusion of stuff through the solid beta. And that's slow. So, and, and what that means is that in many cases you have alpha left. And in many cases, this looks something like you have alpha in the middle and you have beta on the outside of the crystals. That would be the sort of non-equilibrium non version of the solidification. So, and, and outside here is beta, right? So why do you think it means to melt on the edge? Because what you should think through this, if you heat this back up, this kind of non-homogeneous thing, you'll prove that the beta melts first. So you have these crystals where you have a phase on the outside that melts first. And my guess is that's where the, the terminology comes from, to melt on the edge. But hey, your theory is as good as mine. Okay. Time for more complicated things. So phase diagrams are like music. Very easy to listen to, at least most music, unless you're into some weird genre, but hard to make well, okay? So fortunately for you, most of the time you're just gonna be asked to, well, I don't know, maybe I'll ask you to make a phase diagram someday. But um, reading them is much simpler than it looks. Um, so what I wanna walk you through is what the essential components are of phase diagrams and, 
and how you deconstruct complicated phase diagrams. Um, okay, so we've seen things like lenses, right? right. Liquid, solid. Always, oh, this is composition, this is temperature. Um, you know, we've seen elements like miscibility gaps at low temperature, right? Um, we've seen um, eutectics. And I'm going to isolate just the eutectic piece in the phase diagram. Get liquid. Phase, and I'm going to uh, dash the two phase regions to, to make it simpler. Right? That's really, in essence, what a eutectic is, right, with temperature pointing up. Um, so we did this with a liquid, but you can do this. Oh, it's fuzzy. Come on. There you go. Uh, you can do this with a solid as well, where the, the, the thing that's labeled liquid there is just some other solid phase. So I'll call it gamma. Right. So I'm just taking a snapshot, sort of a, a cut out of the phase diagram, right? So what's a peritectic? Um, so the paratectic that we developed looked something like this. Um, alpha liquid, alpha plus liquid, which I'm should, for consistency dash. And then at lo another low temperature phase appears, which I'll call beta. And um, so, by the way, when it's all solids, then people tend to call it eutectoid and oid. I know the Greek, the, the terminology oid seems to indicate some degenerate version of eutectic, but I don't care what you call it. To be honest, in most research, we get kind of sloppy. We call everything eutectic. It, the purists will say it's only a eutectic when there's a liquid involved. I don't care. Like, to me, it's always a eutectic when it looks like this. I don't care what the three phases are. Okay, so, but then to be correct, I should say there's a peritectoid version. Just so when you hear that terminology or you meet some 85 year old metallurgist. Right, so I can call this alpha, beta, and then this is a other solid phase, gamma. Okay, so what, what are these elements in essence? Um, I should have been more organized on the board. So this is a construction, the eutectic is a construction by which a new phase appears at high temperature. So Right, because at low temperature I have alpha and beta, and at high temperature something new appears. So, if you think about it, um, upon cooling, gamma goes to alpha plus beta. And here, so what happens upon cooling here. So here upon cooling, you make a phase disappear. Here upon cooling, you make a phase appear. So here you have that alpha plus gamma uh, form beta upon cooling. So that means upon heating, the opposite happens. You still see the bottom of the board, right? So upon heating, we get alpha plus beta going to gamma. And upon heating here, we get beta disappearing into alpha plus gamma.
So essentially, a peritectic and a eutectic are the same, but with an opposite role of temperature. So in a eutectic, a single phase disappears in cooling, right? Gamma disappears, and that's what happens in a peritectic upon heating. So these are essentially the same thing, right? If you look at the peritectic upon heating, a single phase disappears into alpha. And actually, if I had a screen, I would take this picture, I would flip it on its head, and it looks like that, right? So if I take the, if I invert the temperature here, it's exactly that. And the same for this, right? If I invert the temperature of this, it's exactly that. So essentially, peritectics and eutectics are, I'll keep on so you can see the board. Okay, peritectics and eutectics are the same thing. They are all constructions by which a phase either appears or disappears. Right? So here, liquid or, al or gamma appears at high temperature. In the paratechnic, the new phase appears as you lower the temperature. But they're exactly the same, right? You just invert the role of temperature. So the thing that maybe you should remember is that paratechnics and eutectics they are three phase constructions by which a new phase either appears or disappears. So it's like the way to make something a new, you know, it's, it's like screening, right? You sc screening people, it's like the way you bring in a new thing in a phase diagram or make it disappear, you have to do it through these reactions because because of the common tangent constructions, things don't just disappear most of the time into something of the same composition, right? If, if, if gamma here could transform into something of the same composition, then I don't need to do this complicated three-phase reaction, right? Then just gamma goes to whatever, gamma prime. And we'll see some examples of that. It's just that that's surprising. Um, now, these are also called invariant reactions. And the reason is that the Gibbs phase rule tells you that there's no variation in them, right? So if you write down the Gibbs phase rule, um, the degrees of freedom is one because we fixed the pressure, right? All these diagrams are at pressure one plus the number of components minus the number of phases. So it's one plus two. If we have three phases present, it's zero. So the, the degrees of freedom is zero, which is exactly what this construction tells us, right? There's only one temperature at which the three phases appear, right? And they have all have a fixed composition. So, or to translate this, if in a binary system at constant pressure, you wanna have three phases in equilibrium, there's only a specific composition at which the phases can do it and a specific temperature, right? I mean, this is basically the triple point equivalent, right? In a one component phase diagram. There's only one condition. Okay, so there are two more elements um, that I wanna show you, and then we are ready to play in the big leagues. So, so these are the most uh, important reactions in, in two-phase systems. And while we're not explicitly going to do binary uh, ternary systems in this class, just gets a little fuzzy to draw, uh, there are essentially the same related variants that make up ternary phase diagrams. There are two more constructions. You know, let me make them here so I have that board to have more fun later. Um, and that's what's called congruent reactions.
And there are things, for example, like congruent melting. And so what that is, let's say you have a compound, gamma, and here's the liquid, liquid plus gamma, gamma plus liquid. So you have these two phase regions here. Then at a single point, here the the solid the 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 solid phase disappears in the into the liquid. That's the congruent melting point. Um, we've actually seen a congruent point. It was not a melting point, but when I did the simple phase diagram of a compound, like where we had the compound go into solid solution. Right? If I remember when I draw this, and this will say now solid solution. This is gamma. So this was also a congruent point. Okay, so most of binary phase diagrams, like 99%, is made up out of eutectic, eutectoids, peritectoids, and congruent points. So first I'm gonna draw some simpler phase diagrams, um, and then we're gonna show some real ones if we have time today, otherwise we'll do that next week to sort of see how you deal with complexity. So, so let's say you, you have a phase diagram with one compound. Okay, this pen is done. So let's see how that would look like. So this is the composition axis, this is temperature, right? And so now we have a compound somewhere in the middle and I'll assume that it congruently melts, call this gamma. So that means the liquid sort of starts out kind of like that. All right, so way up here is liquid. Um, out here will be melting points of pure A and melting points of pure B. So if this compound occupies the whole temperature regime, then all to complete this phase diagram, all you have to worry about is how do I make the liquid disappear on this side and on that side? And the solution is perfectly local. So you could do that by a eutectic, right? So you, um, you make it disappear by a eutectic. Voila, this side is done. So do you see I solved this side of the phase diagram without ever worrying about that side? So phase diagrams are local, that's the good news. So what do I do with the other side? I don't know, you could um, decide what you like there, right? Um, does the liquid here disappear by a paratectic or does it appear by a eutectic? I don't know, but let's do another eutectic maybe, right? So I don't know, maybe that's a eutectic here. Voila. So do you see that this is like, this is not some magic, right, phase diagrams? Like as soon as I have some basic information, there are only sort of a few reasonable ways that I can sort of finish the thing up. And by the way, this is my classic final exam question. I can guarantee you that there is one like this. There's some version of it where I either give you an incomplete phase diagram that I make you finish, or I give you just the description, the, the description in words of a phase diagram and I make you draw it. And so you should practice this a little bit. Because um, this is kind of important because, you know, in real research, most of the time people actually don't give you a phase diagram. You know, you know pieces of it because you've seen that under some conditions you synthesize some phase, under other conditions you get two phases. So you tend to have, you know, you tend to have like pieces of this and you have to make sense about how to connect it all together. Okay. Um, you should also be able to then draw free energy curves, right? So if I were to like ask you, I don't know, how do the free energy curves look like here? How would the free energy curves look like there? So 
So the free energy curves should reflect the fact here that there are three single phases present, alpha, gamma, and beta, and two two-phase regions between them. So I think by now, I hope you get a sense of how that would look like schematically, right? That would look something like you would have alpha, you would have gamma coming through, you would have beta for the free energy curve, and then you'd have two two-phase regions that are spanned between them. So you have alpha, gamma, beta, alpha plus gamma, gamma plus beta. Okay. So you're comfortable with this, like seeing the phase diagram and seeing the free energy curves uh, into some fuzzy picture in front of you. Okay, let's see how well you can do this. Um, as we get deeper into real phase diagrams, it may be handy to grab the slides and mark them up unless you want to draw really complicated phase diagrams in your notes. Okay, let's skip that. Okay, so let's look at a complicated phase diagram here, for example. This is titanium nickel, important sort of base for super alloys. And so, you know, you look at this first and you go like, what the hell, like, you know, uh, looks way too complicated. But again, keep in mind that phase diagrams are local, right? So when you zoom in on a particular region, it's all a lot simpler than anything. So maybe let's first analyze like, you know, what, what three phase equilibria, like, Take a, a minute to stare at this and try to figure out all the different components that we've drawn on the board, like eutectics and paratectics and congruent points and stuff like that, right? So, so stare at that for a minute. That gives me also the opportunity to get some coffee. So how many eutectics did you find? Uh, Louis, is that four you're seeing or five? Six? Four? Just nod your head when I get the right number. Four? Four. Does anybody bid more? Everybody's with four. What's that weird dashed line on the bottom? Ah, uh, yeah. You know, that changes my answer. Fair, and I should have told you that. Uh, a dashed line is when they're not sure about the answer. That made somebody thinks it should be that. So let's take the dashed line as real. So are you sticking to four, Lewis? Anybody bids more? Okay, any paratectics? One paratectic, anybody wants more? Going once, twice. Yeah, there are actually five eutectics and one paratectics, but, but I agree it was a bit ambivalent. Okay, let's do the paratectics first. Uh, sorry, eutectics first, right? So here's one, here's two. This is kind of like, but I agree, the dashed line was deceptive, right? Personally, I think this is wrong. It's highly unlikely to make a compound at A, B composition disappear at low temperature, but uh, we'll see. Uh, here's another one, right? And here's another one. So there are five uh, eutectics, and there is actually one slightly camouflaged paratectic, right? And that's right here. So the reason you know this, right, is that there's a new phase, this titanium two nickel, this new phase is appearing uh, there. So this has to be a paratectic construction. It makes a new phase um, appear at, um, at low temperature. Um, you know, can I erase things? Yes, let's see, I can. Hope it erases everything. No. 
someday when this class is over, I'll figure out how to use an iPad properly. Um, but so let's say that, um, what was I gonna do as an example? Let's say you like, like cool down here. So what happens all, so again, phase diagram is local, right? You really couldn't care less about all this stuff, right? And all this stuff, right? Unless there's any two phase regions touching your composition, you, I don't care what happens there. So it's very simple, right? So first you have liquid, then you enter and you make like, so you go liquid, then you go two phase region here, right? So now we're here, that's liquid plus titanium nickel compound. Uh, then you hit this line, which is always fun, right? You hit a paratectic. So uh, after the paratectic, you have, darn. Okay, after the paratectic, you have Ti2Ni plus Ti-Ni. So what has to happen at the paratectic temperature, right, upon cooling? What has to happen there? That the liquid has to react Okay, so the paratectic reaction here upon cooling is that the liquid has to react with TiNi to make Ti2Ni. That's the paratectic reaction here. And in this case, it's not a hard paratectic reaction because the liquid composition is pretty close to the Ti2Ni. So you don't need to, a lot of diffusion to update the liquid composition to Ti2Ni. And then you cool this further. And then if the dashed line is correct, you would have a eutectic reaction where you end up with two I, sorry, Ti2Ni plus Tini. Okay, it's a bit of a mess. Sorry about that, but hopefully you know how to read phase diagrams, right? Um, yeah, not much else to say about this. T titanium nickel, of course, um, famous um, shape memory alloy. Um, you should be able to. I'm not going to do it now, but if I sort of were to ask you, like, oh, sketch me the free energy curves at like here. You should be able to figure that out, right? Um, oh, maybe one more thing to note that sometimes throws off confusion. Um, you, you have sort of the same issue here that sometimes single phase regions show up as a line, but they really are a collapsed region. It just means that these single phases have such low solubility um, that they show up, that the domain is so small you can't really show it. Um, one thing you may, may notice that in general, single phase regions, um, let me erase everything. Single phase regions are always separated uh, from each other by two phase regions, almost always. Okay, so for example, you know, if you look at uh, um, Ti and I2 and, and Ti and I, there's a two phase region in between. If you look at Ti and I3 and the liquid, so here and here, there's a two phase region in between. It is unusual, though not impossible, I'll come to it later, that you would have a, a construction of phasing and where you have sort of one phase and two phase, right? Where there's nothing in between, no two phase region. And the reason is if this is a first order transition, this goes way back to what we taught you, the free energy curves cross over, there is discontinuity of the first derivatives. So that means they cross over with a different slope. And if they cross over with a different slope, there is always a common tangent that's lower. So the way this always will look like is that this will always look something like alpha plus beta, beta, in whatever variable. Well, in whatever extensive variable, right? Because discontinuities only show up with extensive variables. The only time that this is possible, this construction, is when the transformation is second order. Because if you remember, if the transformation is second order, then the first derivatives are constant. They are constant across the transition. If you remember that, that means you, we have no heat of transformation, for example, right? For example, if you do it in temperature, the entropy of both phases is the same at the phase boundary. So in that case, curve, free energy curves just join and there is no two phase region. I'll show you later a phase again where that happens, but it's quite rare because structural transitions are most often, uh, actually structural transitions are always first order. Okay.
So let me do another one. For those of you interested in oxide, here's a yttria-stabilized zirconia uh, phase diagram. Again, looks very complicated and intimidating at first, but you can sort of go through this, right? I mean, so what do you get here? Let me first pick out, um, okay, so let's do the eutectics, right? There's eutectic here. There's a eutectic here. There's a eutectic here. There's one here. And I think that's it, right? I miss one. Okay, and if you do paratectics, right, we have a paratectic here, because some new phase here is appearing uh, from the other one. And I think that's it for paratectics. And then there's some subtle lines here, which um, depend. So if you look carefully at this area here, uh, this is the, the pure zirconia site, ZRO2. Here there are actually, I'm gonna enlarge this, right? Um, there's like this, do you see this little tiny line here? That separates low temperature, which is monoclinic. The MON stands for, this is the monoclinic variant of, of ZRO2. Um, and then, um, it's a little, it's really hard to see here. Uh, then here is the tetragonal variant. This is tetragonal ZRO2. And this is actually cubic ZRO2. So these are different polymorphs of ZRO2. Uh, the cubic one is the one that we are all interested in technologically because the cubic one, this domain here is very large, right? So the cubic one allows for a lot of solubility of yttrium oxide. And if you remember why we like yttrium oxide and zirconium oxide is because uh, it creates oxygen vacancies. And so it enhances the oxygen conductivity. And yttrium stabilized zirconia is used as an oxygen conductor, right? It's the oxygen conducting membrane in oxygen centers, sensors. Uh, and if you remember, I brought that up in the context of um, exhaust in cars. Uh, so the cubic phase is the one of interest. Um, but again, you know, this is all local, right? So uh, you have sort of a congruent reaction here, for example, uh, as well. So uh, if you're just sort of interested in what sort of goes on here, you just have a eutectic construction. So you don't have to worry about all um, the uh, other parts of the phase diagram. Okay. Um, what I'm gonna do in the next lecture, but maybe, you know, if you wanna have fun, well, my type of fun, um, I love this phase diagram. This is actually, um, uh, aluminum magnesium, uh, which is um, can alloys, right? Like soda cans is all aluminum magnesium, essentially. It's just aluminum with small amounts of magnesium. Uh, typically one to 3%. The body is roughly 1% magnesium. The, the top of a can is 2% and the lid is 3%. And if you think about it, it's logical because the lid has to be the strongest because you pull on it and the can is the weakest part. So it has less solid solution hardening. Um, but by the way, it's a real pain when you recycle, right? When you recycle a can, you got sort of a mix of all the three. But anyway, the reason I love this because I love this piece. This come out of a real uh, book. Like I have no idea what's going on there. This looks like a thing like somebody would do on an exam like with thick pen so that when I grade it, I have no idea what, I, what I'm supposed to like make out of it. Um, and let me tell you what it is not. What it is not is this. Okay, so, okay, let me, I need space. And the solutions are, are in the text, but you should really play with this, okay? So what it is not is this. Okay, so on one side, of course, we have aluminum. On the other side, we have Al12, blah, 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 right? This phase here, Al12, magnesium 17. And of course, there's this phase that has to appear, and then the liquid has to disappear, right? So. Some people might want to think of drawing it like this. Again, uh, aesthetics doesn't apply in phase diagrams. Right, let's just do everything together, right? In harmony. Um, this can't be correct, right? Because this is four phases in equilibrium. One, two, three, four. And the Gibbs phase rule tells you that in a binary, I already lose all my degrees of freedom when I have three phases. So when I have four, I'm kind of at minus one degree of freedom. So this cannot be correct. 
but it sort of looks a bit like this. And by the way, there are other problems, right? It almost looks like the liquid is not even at a point here. The liquid almost looks like it has a compositional range which is stable. So, um, you know, the solutions are in the slides later. Of, but what I often ask students is, can you find a way to fix this? So can you draw a construction that makes, has the same result, right? The liquid has to disappear, right? When you cool down and this AL3 MG2 has to appear, right? And the trick to think about this is that you have to do that in multiple steps. You can't make the liquid disappear and the AL3 MG2 appear at the same, in the same reaction. So you'll have to do some reaction where the liquid disappears and then later in lower in temperature, you have to do some reaction where the AL3 MG2 disappears. The cool thing about this problem is that there are multiple solutions. And let me tell you, if you can do this, I think there are actually like four solutions if I remember, um, you're, you, then you're good. So I would say try it without looking at the solutions and I'll go over them briefly in class um, on Friday. Zhenyang, Friday's class, right? Because I've gotten so confused. It's yeah, class. Friday is the class. Friday's class, okay. Because then we're definitely done on Monday, so good. Okay, um, I should stop now because I'm over time. Good seeing all of you. And um, I'll see you on Friday for the solution to this exciting cliffhanger. <laughs>